bring in Peter King from the MMQB.com. Pete, how are you? Dan, how's it going with you? Doing okay here. Uh, USC has named Clay Helton as the permanent head coach. I know that there was a little bit of chatter last night about Chip Kelly. Did you? Is there any possibility that Chip Kelly, if he does leave, would even go back to college football? Dan, I think the best way to answer that question is Chip Kelly doesn't really talk to many people in the coaching business. Um, he kind of reminds me of what Jimmy Johnson was came in. Um, people in the pro football world really didn't know him very well. And even college football, Jimmy never called up guys and said, hey, what do you think? So uh, anybody who says, yeah, you know, I talked to Chip and here's what he said, I, I'd be surprised. He just doesn't, he's just not a guy who sidles up to people and says, here's what you think. However, I'll just say that, you know, Andy Reid coached in Philadelphia for 14 years. The last six years, he won one playoff game. And it wasn't until after that sixth year when he went, whatever he did, four and 12, that Jeff Lurie decided that it's time for a change. So if Chip Kelly jumps, he's going to have to jump on his own because it's not going to be a case where Jeff Lurie is going to go to him on January 4th and say, we want you out. Um, and in addition, uh, I've been told <clears throat> by people in Philadelphia who know that Kelly is absolutely resolute about uh, – finishing the job there. Now, whether he does get to finish the job there two, three years from now, who knows? But uh, personally, my feeling is Kelly's going to be back in 2016 coaching the Eagles. Yeah, that's feeling I get as well. Uh, with the uh, New England-Denver game last night, um, at what point does Denver see enough of Brock Osweiler that it doesn't matter Peyton Manning's health? Well, I think probably internally they they have uh, <coughs> excuse me they've all but decided that now. Um, you know, I, I think one of the things that that smart people who run businesses do is they don't make a decision until they have to make a decision. So let's say for the sake of argument that the next two weeks, Brock Osweiler throws no touchdowns and six interceptions and Manning comes back at the Wednesday practice and is throwing the ball better than he has all year. Well, then Manning will probably play again. But clearly, if Osweiler continues on this path, it would be a major surprise to see Manning back in the lineup this year. I think he's played better than anyone thought he would be. Mm -hmm. He would play. And, Dan, here's the other thing. Last night I talked to Evan Mathis, the, the, uh, the veteran guard, and he, he basically, uh, you know, he said, look, he's the exact same guy when he was a backup who, you know, was never going to play because Manning was going to play forever as he is today. And I think, you know, when he, when he plays and wins. So I think that the people uh, who are going to make that decision know that they've got a solid guy there and won't have to uh, do anything really drastic. They're just going to let this guy play and uh, and just play the game without a lot of without drawing a lot of attention to himself. Uh, you know, without making any big pronouncements. Uh, I just think they're gonna they're gonna try to play. And when Manning comes back ready, I'm sure if they're winning and he's playing well, that Manning is just going to have to sit. Do you see Peyton Manning playing anywhere in the NFL next year? That's a good question. I know what Mike said on TV on our air last week. Uh, <clears throat> all I know, because I have not talked to whoever told Mike that, and uh, all I know is that every year when I go to training camp, I always ask Manning about it, and he always says the same thing. I'll decide after this year when I see how I have played this year I'll see if I still enjoy it, and I'll see if anybody wants me to play. He's going to play as long as he enjoys it and he thinks he can be effective. So I think if he feels at the end of this year that uh, that he really still loves playing uh, and he feels like this is a fluky thing that caused his, his arm to, 
not be able to throw the ball well, I think he'd be interested in playing again. But those, I, I'm not, I'm not convinced that those are are absolutes yet. Couple other things, uh, Gronk. Um, I know that they. It, it feels like now it's a sprain or a deep bruise there, and that he might might miss a game and might not even miss that. Uh, have you heard any other update on on Gronk? I know he was getting an MRI today. Yeah, yeah. I, I, the only thing I know is he was getting an MRI when they <clears throat> when they got back to Foxborough, and I just woke up about fifteen minutes ago, so I don't know anything else that happened. But it, it look. The fact that he's able to walk out of the stadium on his own and though walking slowly, walking without a limp, I think uh, gave everybody a lot of hope that he's probably going to be okay. But again, I, I don't, I don't have any information for you on that one. The MMQB dot com comes out every day, talking to Peter King, Sports Illustrated, and NBC Football Night in America. Uh, Rex Ryan said that his staff did not have the replays weren't available to them during that game. Pete, I find it hard to believe that these stadiums aren't all outfitted, you know, the same given the amount of the importance of replay here and, and the amount of money that's made here. Why don't we have the infrastructure that allows every coach the same with the headsets that are going to work and replay for every, every team. I, I find that mind boggling. That's a really good question, and uh, I think one of the things that happens at each stadium. I was confused when he with with what he said. I was confused with whether he meant simply on the board in the stadium, or whether he also meant uh, you know upstairs. Whether you know uh, the the coach's booth wasn't outfitted. Uh, with television so that they could actually see the replays. That would be, uh, you know, I, I don't think that would be possible because there, because most teams have their replay guy upstairs. Yeah. And so, uh, you know, I, I'm mind boggled by that. And uh, the Chiefs last night, I mean, were saying that they're just like any other team. In the NFL, so I, I really, I'd like a little bit more clarity on that from from Rex. The other thing with Ben Roethlisberger with concussion protocol, that hit that he took, I and I know there's somebody's job who's just there to observe this. If this was helmet to helmet by Michael Bennett. Um, I, I'm just surprised they don't err on the side of caution if you see something like that with these quarterbacks that somebody would at least have pause that. He, he took a hit to the helmet from a 300-pound lineman there, and then later in the game, he's, he's out because of concussion protocol. Well, I do know this because I talked to the guy who was on the Seahawks sidelines, and I wrote something about it today for Monday Morning Quarterback. Um, if, you know, they don't check every player who, as a matter of course, uh, gets hit helmet to helmet it, without trying to be overly, uh, I don't know, solicitous or, or whatever the right word here would be. If you checked every player who exhibited no sign of any concussion, uh, you know, after every helmet to helmet hit, it would, you might be doing it 40 or 50 times a game, sometimes more than one on one play. But but I think I think the bigger issue there is that I think that play happened, if I'm not mistaken, Dan, because Richard Ellenbogen, who was on the sidelines of the Steelers game yesterday in Seattle, and who witnessed the Roethlisberger thing, I think that play happened maybe with eight to nine minutes left in the game, and Roethlisberger came to them right before the two minute warning and said, basically, I've got a headache. So, uh, you know, I think had they, uh, with many of these guys, I think if you examine them right after they take a helmet-to-helmet hit, it, it's, it's not going to show up as, as anything. And again, you know, I'm not trying to be callous toward this, but I think this whole program is about we're going to look at guys who show some sign of or their, their head hits the ground violently, or there is some monstrous helmet-to-helmet hit. 
Yeah. I went back and I saw that play last night after it. And although there was a helmet to helmet hit, I, I didn't. I mean, I think I see 50 of those in every game. That's just my feeling. I might be wrong about that. But I think that this program is in place so that when there is some sign of unsteadiness, right away they will go in and examine a guy. And there, there just wasn't a sign when that happened with Roethlisberger. Thank you, Pete, for getting up. We know you had a long night. Uh, thank you for joining us. All the best, Dan. Take care. Peter King, Sports Illustrated, the MMQB.com.